Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight we're going to start out with Ruth Robinson Duccini, who died recently at the age of 95. Well, last year we did Margaret Pellegrini, who was the second to last surviving female munchkin from The Wizard of Oz. Ruth Robinson Duccini was the last surviving female munchkin and the second to last survivor overall. In this interview, she talks about getting the job on the set of The Wizard of Oz. Well, I was I was working with the Harvey Williams troupe. I had joined them after I graduated from high school, and Harvey found out that MGM was casting, uh, was asking for short people for The Wizard of Oz. So um, a couple of them, two or three of them, were ta- a little taller than I am. We, was, we weren't sure whether we'd all get a job, but we yeah. all drove out to uh, Culver City. They couldn't get as many small people as they wanted, so we all got a job. And the rest is history. With Ruth Duccini's death, the last surviving munchkin is Jerry Merritt, who's 93. I'm going to move on now to Hiro Onida, a Japanese war veteran who died recently at the age of 91, and he has a familiar story, and I'm going to let Matthew Bannister of the BBC4's last word tell it. Hiro Onida was the Japanese army officer who carried on fighting the Second World War until 1974. He was trained as an intelligence officer. On December the 26th, 1944, he was sent to Lubang Island in the Philippines under orders to hamper enemy attacks. His orders also said that under no circumstances was he to surrender or take his own life. When American forces took control of the island in February 1945, Hiro Onoda and three other soldiers took to the hills, where they continued to carry out guerrilla actions. One of the four surrendered in 1949. Two others were shot dead in different police actions. But Lieutenant Onoda still refused to give up. It wasn't until 1974 when his wartime commanding officer, by this time a bookseller, was brought out of retirement and travelled to Lubang formally to order him to cease fire that he agreed to surrender. He was pardoned by the President of the Philippines. In a BBC interview, Hiro Onoda reflected on his experience. To become a prisoner is the worst thing possible. You will be criticised for the rest of your life and you will be ostracized from your community. Japan could be described as a culture based on shame. I think this helped a society with so many people in such a small space. On Lubang, I didn't want to be seen as a failure. I was chosen to carry out a certain mission, and that in itself was a source of pride. I didn't want people to think I looked heroic, but couldn't achieve anything. I feel satisfied that I protected my honor and carried out my mission to the end. Although I've been fighting the war, sacrificing myself for 30 years, I realized that everything related to war was now viewed negatively in Japan, and I didn't want to live in those conditions. I emigrated to Brazil. I thought I would prove myself by setting up a cattle ranch and a wilderness training school. Some Japanese people say I abandoned my country. My face, the blood running through my veins. You can't change that. I'll always be Japanese. Hiro Odenada, who's died aged 91. Well, that plot's been used on a lot of sitcoms. Tony Randall and Pat Morita did a hilarious version of that on The Odd Couple. And it was also done once on Gilligan's Island, which brings us to our next subject, Russell Johnson, who died recently at the age of 89. Russell Johnson started out as a war hero. He was a pilot and shot down over the Philippines and stranded on the Philippines during World War II. He won a Purple Heart for that. Being stranded on islands is apparently our theme tonight. Anyway, he became an actor. He did a couple of great turns on Twilight Zone, including A Man Who Could Foresee, Lincoln's Assassination, and A Professor Who Built a Time Machine. A little more coincidence, because it wasn't long after that that he got his signature role. The ship's a ground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle With Gilligan, the skipper too The millionaire and his wife the professor and Mary Ann here on Gilligan's Island. The professor in Gilligan's Island, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about it. Starting with the characters, beginning with Jim Backus, a.k.a. Thurston Howell III. Jim was one of those guys that could uh, you'd, you'd meet in the morning when you were getting made up and all of that kind of thing. He'd start telling his stories, or jokes and stories, and he would never stop. It would all day long. 
guy could do it. But he was naturally a funny fellow, and uh, stuff just tumbled out of him. And he would do this grumbling ad lib. You know, he had played Mr. Magoo and all of that. There was a little Mr. Magoo in, in Mr. Howell, you know. And he did all that, and he was funny. You had, sometimes you really had to bite your lip to keep from laughing in the middle of the scene because he was on, on doing all this thing. Wonderful guy. And his wife, Natalie Schaefer, uh, uh, Mrs. Howell, she was a Broadway, uh, a New York actress uh, for many years in the theater. Beautiful young woman. But she was funny, too. She had an enormous, she had a very dry sense of humor. Very funny. Thurston with his money and, and Mrs. Howell, uh, I don't know, she was always flying off somewhere. You know, they were just wild and crazy people. Natalie, funny, funny, funny woman. And, of course, easy to work with. The, the wonderful thing about this cast was the chemistry. It, it worked. And Alan Hale, of course, it was what you saw is what you got. Alan's father was a big star, you know, uh, in this town. So Alan grew up knowing everybody. Alan knew everybody in Hollywood. And he had worked since he was young. And uh, But he was a hail fellow, well met, a jolly guy. A good, just that's the way he was. And then you had uh, the two girls, Tina and uh, Dawn. Uh, Tina had uh, a New York uh, theater career going. Dawn was very young, very new at the time when he started that show. And uh, Bobby Denver, who was the opposite of the character he played. Bob is a school teacher. He taught school. He was very straight, very organized, not this bumbling guy. And yet he had played that character twice, in a way, in Dobie Gillis, where he played this guy, uh, Maynard G. Krebs, you know? But anyway, Bob was not like that at all. The chemistry was great. It was, you know, it, we worked together very well. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it. It's a pleasure to get up and go to work. The essence of it all was the chemistry in this cast was fantastic. It was really wonderful. Most of us, with the exception, I think, of Don and T, everybody else was married. We all had families. Through the years since then, Bob and Don and I have stayed friends, and we, you know, talk to each other by email and by phone, and we've done personal appearances and all that kind of thing together through the years. Tina in New York does not do that kind of thing. Yeah, Tina thought she should have been featured a little more as a star on the show. Here, Russell Johnson talks about his favorite episodes. What I enjoyed on the show was what dream sequences that allowed you to get play other characters in the context of the show. Those were fun. That's how I would call that my my favorite work are those dream sequences. I did one in which I played an old prospector, you know, who tells Marianne that if she will kiss him, he, he'll turn into a prince, okay? And so I loved that one, see, because I'd kiss her and, and, and nothing happened. Then I stole from, from Walter Houston and Treasure of the Sierra Madre. He, he did a little dance as this old guy. And I stole that from him. And after I she said, don't believe everything you hear, girly, I did that little dance. I was always told as an actor, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Oh, there was one in which I got to do my imitation of Cary Grant, you know, Mary Ann, you know, and all of that kind of thing. I saw it. I got a kid. Those are the only two I can really remember. But I love those things. Do you remember some of the classics? There, was, there were a couple classics. Um, there's The Producer with Bill Silvers. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was fun. Everybody loved it. That was a good show. Phil was a nice man. We had some interesting guests. We had Don Rickles. He was a funny guy. And and uh, Zsa Zsa, of course. Struther Martin and who was a good friend of mine. Struther Martin, a very funny guy. Here he closes talking about Sherwood Schwartz, the creator of the show, who we did a couple years ago, and the innocence of Gilligan's Island. Interesting. He kept this show, he kept its innocence. In those days, you were, we were working in a situation where you couldn't see a woman's navel. Darn Wells' shorts, they had to bring it up a little bit so you didn't see her navel. They were fighting all the time with Tina Louise's cleavage. They kept the professor asexual. They didn't want anything going on in the show that had anything to do with sex within the cast. They kept him a guy who didn't really know what was going on. They, had, they brought Jaja Gobor in one time to do a show, and she makes a play for the professor. She read all over him. And he, he's, he's talking about Lepidoptera and flora and fauna. But they kept, and that was right. They kept it right. I've had people here say to me, you know, if they did Gilligan's Island today, you'd all be living in the same tent. It's true. But anyway, so that innocence was kept, and it worked. And, and Sherwood, uh, that was Sherwood's point of keeping the show, keeping it that way. Because writers could move it off, and he would always bring it back. I have great admiration for uh, his work. And I, he's a decent and lovely fellow. And a very fortunate man, too, would to have come up with these two shows that have made him very wealthy. The other Sherwood Short show he's talking about there is The Brady Bunch. Now that the professor's gone, the only two survivors of Gilligan's Island are Ginger and Marianne. So the question, Ginger or Marianne, no longer sexual, but existential. Well, we're going to move completely away from innocence now. We're going to talk about Ken Lanwer, who died recently at the age of 59. Ken Lanwer was the brilliant Wichita, Kansas homicide detective 
who is the mastermind behind catching the BTK serial killer Dennis Raider. BTK stands for Bind, Torture, Kill, and Raider killed 10 people. He terrorized Wichita for 20 years, then took a break, and then came back and killed more. It was Ken Landwehr who used the ruse of a computer floppy disk to catch him, and here's the story. March 2004. In Wichita, Kansas, the serial killer known as BTK had resurfaced after more than 20 years of silence. The public was on high alert, and hundreds of tip-offs poured into police headquarters. Working with the FBI, Ken Landwehr, one of the last remaining members of the Ghostbusters task force, decided to implement the strategy they'd devised in the 1980s, which was to play on BTK's ego and love of publicity. They decided very quickly that they would start calling press conferences, which would look like real press conferences, but they were really ways to very subtly get him to communicate, and to communicate a lot, and it worked. He was seeking this publicity, he loved the publicity, and you know that he was reading the newspaper and turning on the TV every night because he wanted to see himself as BTK on television. We were calling these sort of semi-news conferences to get him communicating so that he would communicate to the point where he made a mistake. Detectives visited the shop and interviewed the staff. One remembered finding a cereal packet with odd markings on it in the back of his pickup truck truck two weeks earlier. Back at his house, he retrieved the box from the rubbish bin. Inside was a note from BTK in which he asked whether or not it would be safe for him to send his next writings to the police station on a floppy disk. He told the police to reply via the newspaper classified ads using another nickname, Rex. Knowing that a computer disk can harbor concealed data about its user, the police responded with an advert that read simply, Rex, it will be okay. As the investigators homed in on a possible suspect, another BTK package arrived at the television station. They opened it. Inside was the glimmer of a possible breakthrough. Well, we got the package, and it's a BTK package, and there is a computer disk. Moments later, a copy of the disk was inserted into a computer loaded with specialized forensic software. In this case, uh, it was evident that there was one valid file on the disk. We're able to see that uh, it appeared that the at some point in time the original title of that document had been Christ Lutheran Church. Whoever had been last using it was logged in to a computer using the username or account name of Dennis. Uh, ran a Google search looking for the church website and right at the very top of the page was the uh, congregational president Dennis Rader. If their suspicions were correct this church-going family man could also be one of America's most prolific serial killers. The 20th of February, 2005. In Wichita, Kansas, the police were keeping a close watch on 59-year-old Dennis Rader. Although they lacked irrefutable evidence tying him to the original crimes, they firmly believed he was the BTK strangler, a serial killer who had stalked and tortured at least eight people in Wichita in the 1970s. To be absolutely certain, a DNA profile was needed. Not wanting to alert their suspect, the police managed to subpoena a tissue sample belonging to Dennis Rader's daughter. Since family members share extremely similar DNA, a simple lab test should tell them everything they needed to know. Finally, they called and said, it's a match. Dennis Rader was uh, ATK. Everybody, I think everybody was relieved um, and everybody was excited. On the 25th of February, police officers in unmarked cars took up positions in the suburb where Dennis Rader lived. At 12.15, Rader appeared, driving his Cherokee home for lunch. As he passed, the police pounced on him. Um, they went up to him, he got, got out, went down on the ground, got handcuffed. The most probable suspect in an investigation three decades old was soon at the FBI's offices in the center of Wichita. After he protested his innocence for a few hours, detectives finally confronted him with the fact that they had DNA evidence to prove their case. They also showed him a copy of the computer disk he had posted to them only days earlier. The FBI agent just leaned, kind of leaned forward a little bit and said, just say it, say who you are. Dennis Rader looked at us and said, I'm BTK. I guess you guys got me on BTK. When Raider was captured, he asked Ken Landwehr, why do you lie to me and say you couldn't trace the floppy disk? And Ken Landwehr just looked at him and said, because I wanted to catch you. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps, and we're going to close with a brief mention of Jay Trainer, who died recently at the age of 70. Jay Trainer was Jay of Jay and the Americans, but he's not the Jay most of us know, because after one hit, he left the group and was replaced by David Blatt. David Blatt had a nicer voice, really beautiful voice, but you couldn't have Dave in the Americans, so they made him change his name to Jay Black. So they were still Jay and the Americans. Anyway, the one hit they had with Jay Trainer's lead singer, the 1962 hit, got to number five called She Cried, and we'll close with it tonight. And when I told her